not a crime. We're here for something that is not a crime. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. Did you take a trip with Ms. Willis in 2023 to, to Belize. Belize? I did. Did you take a trip to California with Ms. Willis in 2023? I did. There's no attempt to con conceal. It's a credit card. Everything is here. Though Russia's pursuit of this particular capability is troubling, there is no immediate threat to anyone's safety. I'm Caitlin Huey Burns in Washington. Welcome to America Decides. In an unexpected move, Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis took to the stand in her misconduct allegation hearing. Court just wrapped up for the day, and she testified about her romantic relationship with special, special prosecutor Nathan Wade. She regularly sparred with the defense attorney. Take a listen. Ms. Willis, I'll ask you to listen to the answer, or excuse me, the question, and keep the answers confined to the question as best you can. I think you'll have more than enough ample opportunity on uh, when the state is well, able to respond. It's highly offensive when someone lies on you, and it's highly offensive when they the try judge. to implicate that you slept with somebody the first day you met with them, and I take exception to it. And let's go now to Nicole Killian joining us from Atlanta. Nicole, I know you've been following this whole trial for a while now. Uh, what a day in the courtroom, to be sure. Um, let's take a step back. What kind of misconduct is the Trump team alleging here when it comes to, to Willis? Well, keep in mind, this was all sparked by a complaint that was filed in January by co-defendant Michael Roman, who was a former Trump campaign operative who was uh, charged in that indictment uh, last summer uh, by uh, District Attorney Fonnie Willis. He basically wants... A not only the district attorney to be disqualified, but he wants this case thrown out. And so since filing that complaint, former President Trump has also signed on to it, as have a few of the other co-defendants. And uh, basically what they are concerned about or what they allege is that uh, they believe that the district attorney may have personally benefited from this personal relationship that she had with Nathan Wade, considering that it was her office that was paying Nathan Wade to serve as a special prosecutor in this case. And then in turn, the pair were taking these trips to police places like California, Florida, uh, the Caribbean. But what we heard from the district attorney uh, in her testimony, as well as from Nathan Wade, is that, yes, they did have a relationship. And they both say that this started after the case uh, was underway in early 2022, that it has since ended in uh, summer of 2023. But the district attorney said that as far as these trips were taken, she doesn't consider them gifts, that she paid uh, Nathan Wade back uh, for anything that he footed in terms of the bill uh, and that she, you know, took responsibility for those travel items and those trips that they took, that this wasn't all Nathan Wade paying for everything, that she paid her fair share and not only did that, but also reimbursed him for these trips. Uh, Nathan Wade also acknowledged it as much, saying that the district attorney often paid him back in cash. Uh, so that was also a subject of the discussion. But, uh, you know, what is interesting, Caitlin, is that some of these defendants, some of these 19 co-defendants are in the room during this testimony, including Harrison Floyd, uh, Trevian Cuddy, or Cudi, I'm sorry, uh, and David Schaefer, the former uh, GOP chair here in Georgia, as well as some of their attorneys. In fact, at times, uh, former President Trump's uh, attorney, Stephen Sadow, was also questioning uh, the district attorney uh, during this period, as well as Nathan Wade. So uh, a lot of players and entities uh, in this courtroom uh, in what became a very intense hearing uh, this afternoon. Yeah, I mean, speaking of that intensity, Nicole, I mean, nobody was expecting Willis to actually testify today. She came into the courtroom um, and took the stand. Can you kind of explain to us what that moment was like and, and what exactly did she say? What stood out to you? Well, I wouldn't say it was completely unexpected. At the end of the day, she had been subpoenaed by Roman's attorney, Ashley Merchant, just as Merchant also subpoenaed Nathan Wade. And so following Wade's testimony, which lasted for several hours, uh, then it was a question of who the next witness would be. And Merchant continued to insist that she felt that Bonnie Willis should testify kind of in the course of having those discussions uh, between the attorneys and the judge. The district attorney walked in and said that she was willing and ready to testify. And so because she didn't object, even though she was trying to quash the subpoena just earlier this week so that she did not have to testify, ultimately she walked in the room and said that she wanted to move forward. And so 
from that point on, we have witnessed the district attorney on the stand uh, again and very contentious at times uh, because she feels that a lot of what's in this filing is not true. Uh, she pushed back very vociferously against that, uh, at times telling some of these attorneys not to yell at her uh, while also taking a sharp tone herself. Uh, but uh, we just learned that uh, this hearing will continue into tomorrow. It is getting ready to uh, wrap up, so we expect that Willis will be back on the stand again Friday. Okay, an important part of a very big case down there in Atlanta. Nicole Killian, thank you very much. It is a newsy day on the court beat. Donald Trump's first criminal trial will begin on March 25th, after a New York judge today denied his bid to dismiss this hush money case. It will be the first criminal trial for a former U.S. president in history. Trump is accused of paying adult film star Stormy Daniels over $100,000 to keep her quiet about their alleged affair ahead of the 2016 election. CBS News chief election and campaign correspondent Bob Costa joins us now from New York. Uh, Bob, you're a campaign correspondent, but the campaign is really in the courtroom these days. Uh, what exactly happened in court this morning? The judge, uh, the justice in this case, set the court date for March 25th. They're going to have jury selection on that day. Uh, they expect this trial to last about six weeks. That's a collision. As you just said, Caitlin, with the campaign trail for former President Donald Trump, right as he's going to try to pivot toward a possible general election campaign, should he wrap up the nomination against President Biden, he's going to be forced to sit through a criminal trial. And if he is the nominee, he also at the same time might be a felon. He's facing multiple felony charges in this case. And the former president did speak shortly after he left the courtroom. Let's take a listen to some of what he had to say. Instead of being in South Carolina and other states campaigning, I'm stuck here. It's an election interference case. Uh, nobody's ever seen anything like it in this country. It's a disgrace. It's a disgraceful situation, actually. And we'll just have to figure it out. I'll be here during the day and I'll be campaigning during the night. All right, so he's calling this election interference. And I heard him say this again at his rally in South Carolina last night that I was covering. I mean, this seems like the kind of rhetoric we may expect to hear moving forward. How does this kind of factor into the campaign? Well, it's a false claim. He's claiming sure. election interference, but he's not bringing any evidence to that point. Uh, he believes that all of these prosecutors, whether it's in the civil fraud case, that there's an expectation there could be a ruling on that tomorrow, on Friday, or in the federal cases with special counsel Jack Smith. He's, he has all this sense of persecution from the prosecution. And part of that, according to sources close to him, is about stoking the support of Republicans to say that their grievances, his grievances, are one and the same when it comes to describing the justice system. The challenge for him and his campaign and Republicans nationwide is, is, is there ever going to be a threshold where all of these legal challenges become a burden on the GOP as they head toward November? At this point, most Republicans I'm speaking to at the strategist level, they say this is all a blizzard of information for most voters. They're not factoring in each hearing, each trial. But you are going to have in late March, starting in late March, a former president sitting for a criminal trial. And let's not forget the disruption that could come on Friday for former President Trump if Judge Gorin, just down the street here, we're on Center Street in Lower Manhattan, if he issues a 300, 400, 500 million dollar fine for the Trump Organization in the civil fraud case, that could be very disruptive, not just for the company that has been at the core of the Trump family for so long, but for the Trump campaign. Yeah, Bob, I mean, you bring up a really important point about kind of the, the, the idea that this is this is a, a kind of a history making moment. I mean, can you kind of walk us through the significance of uh, this being the first criminal trial of a former president? I know it's hard to keep track of all these cases, but that is such a major headline. Well, one of the significant things here is that this case, the hush money case about Stormy Daniels, brings all the issues from 2016 to the forefront of the 2024 campaign. This was a, mm. an older issue. I, I have covered it for years. You've covered it for years. And at its core is that the story of Michael Cohen, 
the longtime Trump fixer, going to this adult film star, Stormy Daniels, and offering payments uh, for her to be quiet ahead of the 2016 campaign. And an election, and this is now being said by Alvin Bragg, the district attorney here in Manhattan, as a criminal scheme to deflect from campaign financial statements, to have all this done kind of under the radar. Trump has said he has done no wrongdoing here and pled not guilty to all of the felony charges. But this brings the characters of 2016 back. Michael Cohen, someone I've sat down with for CBS, he's been on the radar of political journalists and politicians for so long now. And he's such a contrast. That's the old Trump world to this new Trump world that's running the Trump campaign. Chris LaCivita, Susie Wiles running a very corporate style, efficient campaign. But this brings the old Trump world back. And that shakes up the whole political dynamic, potentially. Yeah, that's such an interesting point, a much more sophisticated campaign this time around. But reminders of 2016. Bob Costa, thank you for the context about these court cases. We appreciate your time in reporting. And America's view, Americans' views of the economy are improving. We'll bring you the latest CBS News polling next. You're streaming America Decides. And welcome back to America Decides. New CBS polling shows some good news for the Biden administration. 37 percent of Americans say the U.S. economy is doing well. Ratings of the current economy are at their highest level in more than two years. Meanwhile, 39 percent of Americans approve of the president's handling of the economy. That's a three percent increase from last month. CBS News Executive Director of Elections and Surveys, Anthony Salvanto, joins us now. Anthony, good to see you. Uh, so this is an interesting trend. I'm sure the White House would like any sort of upward mo uh, movement, but at the same time, he's still underwater in terms of his approval. So how do you kind of explain this trend? What are you seeing? It's both things, Caitlin. It's still net negative, but it is trending up. Let me unpack this. There's two big reasons underneath this. One is... The percent of folks who say they expect over the next year or so a growing or a booming economy is trending up. Now, it's not everybody. It's a quarter. But it is up from last fall. And then I'll show you this. Maybe more importantly, the percent who say they're expecting a recession coming, that is trending down. Now, what's important about all this is that underpins then that graph that you showed at the top because you look at this over the course of the last few months, and this line is slowly ticking up. These are incremental increases, but nonetheless, look, a poll can have some variance, but you see this over time, and you start to see a trend. We've talked a lot about how what we call the macro numbers, the large mm. economic indicators, have shown a stronger economy than Americans have been feeling. Maybe that's a lagging part of this. Maybe people mm. are starting to catch up and start to feel it a little bit. And that's what we're seeing here, Caitlin. Yeah, that's a really important point, Anthony, as we've been talking to voters who say that they're not feeling what we what they are seeing on paper yet, but we'll see the trends over the next several months. Um, the other thing, you know, on the minds of everyone these days is is concern over uh, Biden's mental fitness. I know you asked about this in the poll. What did you find? Yeah, we have asked about this and we've done it for a while. And this is important. Things haven't changed much, but there are still today this concern about Joe Biden, where when we ask do, does he have the what people perceive as the mental or cognitive health to serve? You get this fairly low number at 35 percent, and it's important for a couple of reasons. One is that it's not very high, but also in context, Caitlin, we also ask this about the Republican frontrunner, former President Trump. And frankly, he doesn't do all that well either on this measure, but he is perceived as better than Joe Biden on it. So in a way, this speaks not just to the current president and voters' concerns about him, but also to the coming campaign. This is a measure that we're going to have to keep an eye on, Caitlin.
Yes, certainly a defining feature of this campaign. And also, earlier this week, uh, we were all talking about the former president's very controversial comments about NATO. I know you also posed this uh, to participants in the poll. How do Americans feel about that? We did. It was a news-heavy week last night, so we had a lot to talk about, right? So this was one of them. Um, look, bottom line is big support for the U.S. defending NATO countries. It's 75 percent if, it's hypothetical, if there were to be an attack from Russia on those countries, people would want the U.S. militarily to promise support. Okay, and then quickly, um, speaking of lots of news, the border is always kind of front and center for voters that we're talking to. Um, what are they telling you in the poll about their concerns about it? And here's the quick answer. Nobody does well on this. Not Joe Biden. His approval is low. Not congressional Republicans. They are. And what I think is really interesting very quickly is that there was reporting about former president's influence over the Republicans in Congress on whether or not to pass this legislation, but Republican voters do in fact want Donald Trump to have some or a lot of say over mm. what congressional Republicans do about the border. That is striking, maybe not surprising, given the former president's influence over the party as a whole, Caitlin. Interesting that they are inviting it. Well, a lot of news and a good time to take the temperature of Americans, which you do so well. Anthony Salvanto, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And in other news, special counsel David Weiss, who is leading the investigation into Hunter Biden, has charged FBI informant Alexander Smirnoff, who provided derogatory information about President Biden and his son. Smirnoff was arrested in Las Vegas yesterday. Prosecutors claim he made false statements to investigators on multiple occasions, including in September of last year. If convicted, he faces a maximum penalty of 25 years in prison. And coming up, more about that cryptic national security threat from the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. You're streaming America Decides. And welcome back to America Decides. We now know that the Intelligence Committee Chairman Mike Turner's cryptic warning about a serious national security threat has to do with Russia developing a space-based anti-satellite weapon that would violate a treaty banning nuclear weapons in space. The White House has updated the public this afternoon. This is not an active capability that's been deployed. And though Russia's pursuit of this particular capability is troubling, there is no immediate threat to anyone's safety. And joining us now to break this all down is Margaret Brennan, CBS News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent and, of course, moderator of Face the Nation. Margaret, good to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, so Kirby was saying that he has some pretty broad concerns about declassifying some of this information. What exactly is he concerned about? Well, and exactly, you don't often see John Kirby put his glasses on and read from a statement, but he's yeah. trying to hit very specific, cleared declassified talking points. Mm -hmm. There's very limited amount of information they can disclose at this point. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons, he said, was because the intelligence community only arrived at a higher degree of confidence mm -hmm. uh, in its assessment within the past few weeks, and disclosing it would reveal more risk, sources, and methods. Uh, but what he indicated was that this has to do with the 1967 treaty that has mm -hmm. to do with nuclear weapons in space. So we know there's some mm -hmm. nuclear component to mm -hmm. what this technology development out of Russia um, is about. But, but what we know for a fact is that this classified, compartmented intelligence was mm -hmm. shared in that classified mm -hmm. setting, a SCIF, mm -hmm. uh, with the House Intelligence Committee members. That was mm -hmm. cleared by the Director of National Intelligence for that information to be shared in that limited setting. They mm -hmm. then went into private were so concerned by what they learned that on a bipartisan basis voted 23 to 1 to say more lawmakers need to know about this because mm -hmm. they felt it needed to mm -hmm. uh, be dealt with policy-wise, that it couldn't just be closely held information. It was of such high level of concern that others needed to know about it. So mm -hmm. in terms of what was shared today with that gang of four, just the mm -hmm. top leaders, uh, the uh, national security uh, advisor came mm -hmm. to answer some questions. And we know that at mm -hmm. the tail end of that 
they will also brief the Senate at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's ha happened this afternoon, and leaders are coming out and, and um, addressing. Um, if if Russia were actually to deploy such a weapon, I know the White House is saying mm -hmm. that this is still kind of a far-off idea. Um, if this were actually to happen, is the U.S. prepared for this kind of event? Well, and that's the argument for declassification, or at least not with the public, sharing that information with other lawmakers, right? Mm -hmm. That's what the Intelligence Committee members, both the ranking and the chair. So Democrats mm -hmm. and Republicans are saying this is serious, this needs to be dealt with, and sharing that information with other lawmakers allows for that next conversation. What do we do mm -hmm. about it to happen? Yeah. Uh, and so this would indicate that they need some congressional approval or, or mm -hmm. appropriations or some sort of policy policy for lawmakers to be part of. Uh, what I know from our reporting is that mm. this has to do with the Cosmos program. This is a mm. Russian program uh, that has to do with uh, top, launches carrying top secret payloads that the Ministry of Defense has approved and, and said that they are conducting. The specifics mm. of that are where we are stuck right now. Mm -hmm. um, but that what has been described to me by lawmakers, by policymakers, by weapons experts, is that this needs to be discussed for that question of how does it challenge America's dominance, mm. that geostrategic mm -hmm. balance of power. And that's mm. why it matters. And Speaker Johnson said that he wrote a letter last month asking to meet with the president of the United States about it. Yeah. That's how Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, ended up on Capitol Hill today. Interesting. A lot of fast moving parts here. Um, you also spoke with Jen Easterly, who is the director of CISA, the, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Um, what did she have to say about this? Well, it, the director spoke with me about her recent trip to Ukraine mm -hmm. and that concern broadly about Russia and the threat it poses. I mm -hmm. did ask her, uh, as did many others there to, today, mm -hmm. other journalists, about this weaponization of space mm -hmm. and this new disclosure. disclosure. She mm -hmm. couldn't get into the details, mm -hmm. but she said, don't look at these things in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. The war in Ukraine should mm -hmm. be seen as this broader indication of Russia's intent and threat. Take a listen. I think it just further reinforces the fact that Russia is a very real threat. It's a threat to U.S. national security. It's a threat to global security. It's a threat to all of our critical infrastructure. We know space is a key piece of that. And it just reinforces the point that we cannot do anything that further empowers Putin and his ability to, if Ukraine falls, his ability to then uh, go into Europe. So Easterly oversees the agency that really tries to protect U.S. infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Just think about how interconnected satellites are, technology yeah. is, with the basic infrastructure that not just the government mm -hmm. has something to do with, but the private sector and what you and I, you know, mm -hmm. use on a daily basis in terms of technology. So this mm -hmm. broader threat of Russia being willing to just blow past norms, international treaties. There's a reason mm -hmm. John Kirby brought it up, this idea. The world mm -hmm. agreed not to do this, and Russia, we think, is doing this mm -hmm. for a reason because of those continued challenging of international laws and norms. Yeah, and I think that's so accessible to everyday Americans who would be concerned about this. But interesting to see her kind of connect the dots at a time yes. that Republicans in Congress, of course, are pushing back, um, very critical of uh, funding for Ukraine. Well, at least the speaker won't it, entertain the vote exactly. right, on that national security supplemental. So very much of the moment. Exactly. Uh, Margaret Brennan, thank you so much, as always, for your reporting. We appreciate that. And that does it for us today. We will be back with another edition of America Decides on Monday at 5 p.m. Eastern. You're streaming CBS News.